From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Saturday afternoon session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by a missionary choir. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oaks, First Counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Saturday afternoon session of the 192nd Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings to all who are in attendance or who are participating by means of television, radio, or the internet. The music for this session will be provided by a missionary choir under the direction of Ryan Eggett with Joseph Peebles and Andrew Unsworth at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing Call to Serve. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Takashi Wada of the Seventy.
kind Heavenly Father, we're grateful to Thee for this great conference. As we gather here today, we're grateful for all Thy blessings. We are grateful for the opportunity to hear the words of our prophets and seers and revelators. We ask that Thou would continue to watch, watch over us and help us to understand the things that you need to understand, and that we might be able to elevate our hearts and mind to be able to become more like thy son, Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the atonement sacrifice of thy son, Jesus Christ. May we always be reminded to become like him and learn, learn his ways, and so that we'll be able to understand how to serve better. We ask that thy blessing be upon all those who will be speaking to us, and that the, their, their message will touch our hearts and help us know what we can do better. These blessings and favors we ask in the sacred name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the First Presidency, will now present the general authorities, general officers, and Area 70s of the Church for sustaining vote. Brothers and sisters, it is my privilege to present the General Authorities, Area 70s, and General Officers of the Church for your sustaining vote. Please express your support in the usual way, wherever you may be. If there are those who oppose any of the proposals, we ask that you contact your stake president. It is proposed that we sustain Russell Marion Nelson as prophet, seer, and revelator and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Dallin Harris Oaks as first counselor in the First Presidency, and Henry Benyon Eyring as second counselor in the First Presidency. Those in favor may manifest it. Those opposed, if any, may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain Dallin H. Oaks as president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and M. Russell Ballard as acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Those in favor, please signify. Any opposed may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain the following as members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. M. Russell Ballard, Jeffrey R. Holland, Dieter F. Uchtdorf, David A. Bednar, Quentin L. Cook, R. Todd Christofferson, Neil L. Anderson, Ronald A. Rasband, <coughs> Gary E. Stevenson, Dale G. Renland, Garrett W. Gong and Ulysses Suarez. Those in favor, please manifest it. Any opposed may so indicate. It is proposed that we sustain the counselors in the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators. All in favor, please manifest it. Contrary, if there be any, by the same sign. We have released Elders Weatherford T. Clayton, LeGrand R. Curtis, Jr., Randy D. Funk, Christoffel Golden, Walter F. Gonzalez, Larry S. Catcher, Lynn G. Robbins, and Joseph W. Sataki as General Authority 70s and grant them emeritus status. Those who wish to express gratitude to these brethren and to their wives and families for their years of dedicated service may do so by the uplifted hand. We also note with appreciation the Area 70s who have completed their service 
during this past year and whose names can be found on newsroom.churchofjesuschrist.org. Those who wish to join in expressing gratitude to those brothers for their excellent service may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain the other general authorities and Area 70s, including six new Area 70s announced earlier this week in newsroom.churchofjesuschrist.org and the general officers as presently constituted. All in favor may do so by an uplifted hand. Those opposed, if any. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for your continued faith and prayers on behalf of the leadership of the Church. Thank you, President Eyring. The choir will now favor us with faith in every footstep. After the singing, we will be pleased to hear from President M. Russell Ballard, acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Sister Kristen M. Yee, who serves as second counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency. Elder Paul V. Johnson of the Presidency of the Seventy will then address us.
Thank you, choir, for singing Faith in Every Footstep. The music and words of that song were written in 1996 by Brother Newell Daly in preparation for the celebration of the 150th anniversary of the arrival of the early pioneers to the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. Although this song was written in preparation for that celebration, its message applies to the whole world. I've always loved the chorus. With faith in every footstep, we follow Christ the Lord, and filled with hope through His pure love, we sing with one accord. Brothers and sisters, I testify that as we follow Jesus Christ with footsteps of faith, there is hope. There is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is hope for all in this life. There is hope to overcome our mistakes, our sorrows, our struggles, and our trials and our troubles. There is hope in repentance and being forgiven and forgiving others. I testify that there is hope and peace in Christ. He can carry us today through difficult times. He did it for the early pioneers, and He will do it now for each one of us. This year marks the 175th anniversary of the arrival of the early pioneers to the Salt Lake Valley, which has caused me to reflect on my ancestors, some of whom walked from Nauvoo to the Salt Lake Valley. I have great-grandparents who walked the plains in their youth. Henry Ballard was 20 years old, Margaret McNeil was 13, and Joseph S. Smith who later became the sixth president of the Church, was just nine when he arrived in the Salt Lake Valley. They faced deprivations of every kind along the trail, such as cold winters, illness, and lack of adequate food and clothing. For instance, when Henry Ballard entered the Salt Lake Valley, he rejoiced in seeing the Promised Land but lived in fear that someone might see him because his clothing he was wearing was so worn out that it did not completely cover his body. He hid himself behind bushes all day until dark and then went to a house and begged for clothing so that he could continue his journey and locate his parents. He was thankful to God that he had reached his future home in safety. My great-grandparents followed Jesus Christ with footsteps of faith throughout each of their trials. I am grateful to them for never giving up. Their footsteps of faith have blessed me and subsequent, subsequent <coughs> generations, just as your footsteps of faith today will bless your posterity. The word pioneer is both a noun and a verb. As a noun, it can mean a person who is among the first to explore or settle a new territory. As a verb, it can mean to open or prepare the way for others to follow. As I think about pioneers, who have prepared the way for others, I first think of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Joseph was a pioneer because his footsteps of faith led him to a grove of trees where he knelt in prayer and opened the way for us to have the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Joseph's faith to ask of God on that spring morning, 1820, open the way for the restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
that included prophets and apostles called to serve on earth once again. I know Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. I know his faith-filled footsteps led him to kneel in the presence of God the Father and his beloved Son, Jesus Christ. The prophet Joseph's footsteps of faith enabled him to be the Lord's instrument in bringing forth the Book of Mormon, which is another testament of Jesus Christ and his atoning grace. Through Joseph's faith and perseverance in the face of incredible hardship and opposition, he was able to be an instrument in the hands of the Lord in establishing the Church of Jesus Christ once again on the earth. During the last General Conference, I spoke about how my full-time missionary service blessed me. I was blessed as I taught about Heavenly Father's glorious plan of salvation, Joseph Smith's first vision, and his translation of the Book of Mormon. These restored teachings and doctrine guided my footsteps of faith and teaching those who were willing to listen to the message of the restoration of the gospel. Our missionaries today are modern-day pioneers because they share the glorious message with people around the world, thus opening the way for our Heavenly Father's children to know Him and His Son, Jesus Christ. Accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ opens the way for everyone to prepare for and receive ordinances and the blessings of the Church and the temple. Last General Conference, President Russell M. Nelson reaffirmed that the Lord has asked every worthy, able young man to prepare for servant, to serve a mission, and that a mission is also a powerful but optional opportunity for young and able sisters. Dear young men and young women, your footsteps of faith will help you to follow the Lord's invitation to serve missions, to be modern-day pioneers by opening the way for God's children to find and stay on the covenant path leading back to His glorious presence. President Nelson has been a pioneer in the Church. As an apostle, he has traveled to and opened many lands for the preaching of the gospel. Shortly after becoming the prophet and president of the Church, he pled with us to increase our spiritual capacity to receive revelation. He continues to teach us to strengthen our testimonies in a devotional for young adults, he said. I plead with you to take charge of your testimony. Work for it. Own it. Care for it. Nurture it so it will grow. Then watch for miracles to happen in your life." Close quote. He's teaching us how to become more spiritually self-reliant. He has said that in coming days it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. I testify that President Russell M. Nelson is the prophet of God on the earth today. Our Savior Jesus Christ is the ultimate pioneer in preparing the way. Indeed, He is the way for the plan of salvation to be accomplished so that we can repent and through faith in Him return to our Heavenly Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's promised to not leave us comfortless. He will come to us in our trials. 
He has invited us to come unto Him with full purpose of heart, and He shall heal us. I testify that Jesus Christ is our Savior and our Redeemer, our Advocate with the Father. Our Heavenly Father has opened the way for us to return to Him by following His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, with faith in every footstep. My great-grandparents and early pioneers faced many obstacles as they came by wagons, handcarts, and walking to the Salt Lake Valley. We, too, will face challenges in our individual journeys through our lives. We're not pushing handcarts or driving covered wagons over steep mountains and through deep snow drifts. We're trying, as they did, to spiritually overcome the temptations and challenges of our day. We have trails to walk. We have hills and sometimes mountains to climb. Although the challenges today are different than those in the early pioneers, that the ones they had are no less challenging for us. It is important to follow the prophet and keep our feet firmly planted on the covenant path of faithfulness as it was for the early pioneers. Let us follow Jesus Christ with faith in every footstep. We need to serve the Lord and serve one another. We need to strengthen ourselves spiritually by keeping and honoring covenants. We should not lose the sense of urgency to keep the commandments. Satan tries to dull our commitment and our love for God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please remember that if anyone should lose their way, we'll never be lost to our Savior. With the blessing of repentance, we can turn to Him. He will help us learn, grow, change as we strive to stay on the covenant path. May we ever follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and with faith in our every footstep, focus on Him, keeping our feet firmly planted on the covenant path. It is my humble prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The book of Samuel includes a lesser known story of David, the future king of Israel, and a woman named Abigail. After Samuel's death, David and his men went away from King Saul who sought his life. They provided watch care for the flocks and servants of a wealthy man named Nabal who was mean-spirited. David sent 10 of his men to salute Nabal and request much needed food and supplies. Nabal responded to David's request with insult and sent his men away empty-handed. Offended, David prepared his men to go up against Nabal and his household, saying, He hath requited me evil for good. A servant told Abigail, Nabal's wife, about her husband's ill treatment of David's men. Abigail quickly gathered the needed food and supplies and went to intercede. When Abigail met him, she fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. Now therefore the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with my own hand. And so David received of her hand that which she had brought him, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. I have hearkened to thy voice. 
and have accepted thy person. They both departed in peace. In this account, Abigail can be seen as a powerful type or symbol of Jesus Christ. Through his atoning sacrifice, he can release us from the sin and weight of a warring heart and provide us with the sustenance we need. Just as Abigail was willing to take Nabal's sin upon herself, so did the Savior, in an incomprehensible way, take upon him our sins and the sins of those who have hurt or offended us. In Gethsemane and on the cross, he claimed these sins. He made a way for us to let go of a vengeful heart. That way is through forgiving, which can be one of the most difficult things we ever do and one of the most divine things we ever experience. On the path of forgiveness, Jesus Christ's atoning power can flow into our lives and begin to heal the deep crevices of the heart and soul. President Russell M. Nelson has taught that the Savior offers us the ability to forgive. Through his infinite atonement, you can forgive those who have hurt you and who may never accept responsibility for their cruelty to you. It is usually easy to forgive one who sincerely and humbly seeks your forgiveness, but the Savior will grant you the ability to forgive anyone who has mistreated you in any way. Then their hurtful acts can no longer canker your soul. Abigail's bringing an abundance of food and supplies can teach us that the Savior offers to those who have been hurt and injured the sustenance and help we need to be made healed and made whole. We are not left to deal with the consequences of others' actions on our own. We too can be made whole and given the chance to be saved from the weight of a warring heart and any actions that may follow. The Lord has said, I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive but out of you it is required to forgive all men. The Lord requires us to forgive for our own good, but he does not ask us to do it without his help, his love, his understanding. Through our covenants with the Lord, we can each receive restrengthening power, guidance, and the help we need to both forgive and to be forgiven. Please know that forgiving someone does not mean that you put yourself in a position where you continue to be hurt. We can work toward forgiving someone and still feel prompted by the Spirit to stay away from them. Just as Abigail helped David not to have an offensive heart and to receive the help he needed, so will the Savior help you. He loves you, and he is meeting you on your path with healing in his wings. He desires your peace. I have personally witnessed the miracle of Christ healing my warring heart. With permission of my father, I share that I grew up in a home where I didn't always feel safe because of emotional and verbal mistreatment. In my youth and young adult years, I resented my father and had angered my heart from that hurt. Over the years and in my efforts to find peace and healing on the path of forgiveness, I came to realize in a profound way that the same Son of God who atoned for my sins is the same Redeemer who will also save those who have deeply hurt me. I could not truly believe the first truth without believing the second. As my love for the Savior has grown, so has my desire to replace hurt and anger with his healing balm. It has been a process of many years requiring courage, vulnerability, perseverance, and learning to trust in the Savior's divine power to save and heal. I still have work to do, but my heart is no longer on a warpath. I have been given a new heart, one that has felt the deep and abiding love of a personal Savior who stayed beside me who gently and patiently led me to a better place, who wept with me, who knew my sorrow. The Lord has sent me compensatory blessings just as Abigail brought what David needed. He has sent mentors into my life. And sweetest and most transformative of all has been my relationship with my Heavenly Father. Through him, I have gratefully known the gentle, protective, and guiding love of a perfect Father. Elder Richard G. Scott said, you cannot erase what has been done but you can forgive. Forgiveness heals terrible, tragic wounds, for it allows the love of God to purge your heart and mind of the poison of hate. It cleanses your consciousness of the desire for revenge. It makes place for the purifying, healing, restoring love of the Lord. My earthly father has also had a miraculous change of heart in recent years and has turned to the Lord, something I wouldn't have anticipated in this life. Another testimony to me of the complete and transformative power of Jesus Christ. I know he is able to heal the sinner and those sinned against. He is the Savior and the Redeemer of the world who laid down his life that we might live again. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. To all that are brokenhearted, captive, bruised, and perhaps blinded or hurt by sin, he offers healing, recovery, and deliverance. I testify that that healing and recovery he offers is real. The timing of that healing is individual, and we cannot judge another's timing. It is important to allow ourselves the necessary time to heal and to be kind to ourselves in the process. The Savior is ever merciful and attentive and stands ready to provide the succor we need. On the path of forgiveness and healing lies a choice not to perpetuate unhealthy patterns or relationships in our families or elsewhere. To all within our influence, we can offer kindness for cruelty, love for hate, gentleness for abrasiveness, safety for distress, and peace for contention. To give what you have been denied is a powerful part of divine healing possible through faith in Jesus Christ. To live in such a way that you give, as Isaiah has said, beauty for the ashes of your life is an act of faith that follows the supreme example of a Savior who suffered all, that he might succor all. Joseph of Egypt lived a life with ashes. He was hated by his brethren, betrayed, sold into slavery, wrongly imprisoned, and forgotten by someone who had promised to help. Yet he trusted in the Lord. The Lord was with Joseph and consecrated his trials to his own blessing and growth and to the saving of his family in all Egypt. When Joseph met his brothers as a great leader in Egypt, his forgiveness and refined perspective were manifest in the gracious words he spoke. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. Through the Savior, Joseph's life became beauty for ashes. Kevin J. Worthen, president of BYU, has said that God can make good come not just from our successes, but also from our failures and the failures of others that cause us pain. God is that good and that powerful. I testify that the greatest example of love and forgiveness is that of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who in bigger, bitter agony said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I know that our Father in heaven desires goodness and hope for each of his children. In Jeremiah we read, For I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace. Jesus Christ is your personal Messiah, your loving Redeemer and Savior who knows the pleadings of your heart. He desires your healing and happiness. He loves you. He weeps with you in your sorrows and rejoices to make you whole. May we take heart and take his loving hand that is ever extended as we walk the healing path of forgiveness is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Heavenly Father and our Savior Jesus Christ have the power to save us and transform us. They can help us become as they are. A few years ago, one of our young grandsons, Aaron, began having health problems. He became fatigued, had quite a bit of bruising, and did not look healthy. After medical testing, he was diagnosed with severe aplastic anemia, a disease where his bone marrow stopped producing red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Without treatment and an eventual cure, his blood could not clot pro properly or fight off infections. So even minor falls, injuries, or illnesses could quickly become life-threatening. For a period of time, he received regular platelet and blood transfusions to keep him out of danger. The doctors explained that the only cure for the disease would be a bone marrow transplant, and the best chance for success would be to have a sibling as the donor. If one of his siblings were an ideal match, the outcome of the transplant could be life-saving. His four younger brothers were tested, and one, Maxwell, was deemed a perfect match. Even with a perfect donor match, 
a bone marrow transplant still poses a serious risk of complications. The process required that Aaron's own cells in his diseased bone marrow be destroyed by a combination of chemotherapy and radiation before receiving the stem cells from his brother Maxwell's bone marrow. Then, because Aaron's compromised immune system, he needed to be isolated in the hospital for several weeks and then at home for several months with special protocols, restrictions, and medications. The hoped-for outcome from the transplant was that Aaron's body would not reject the donor cells that Maxwell's cells would gradually produce the needed red and white blood cells and platelets in Aaron's body. A successful donor transplant causes a very real physiological change. Amazingly, a doctor explained that if Aaron committed a crime and left blood at the crime scene, the police could arrest his brother Maxwell. <laughs> this is because Aaron's blood would come from Maxwell's transplanted cells and have Maxwell's DNA. And this would be the case for the rest of his life. Aaron, being saved by his brother's blood, has spurred many thoughts about the atoning blood of Jesus Christ and the effect of His atonement on us. I would like to focus today on the permanent, life-giving change that occurs as we allow the Lord to work miracles in us. Aaron did not have the power in himself to overcome the disease. His body could not make the blood cells needed to sustain his life. No matter what he personally did, he could not heal his bone marrow. Just as Aaron could not cure himself, we cannot save ourselves. No matter how capable, educated, brilliant, or strong we are, we cannot cleanse ourselves from our sins, change our bodies to an immortal state, or exalt ourselves. It is only possible through the Savior Jesus Christ and His infinite Atonement. There is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. It is His atoning blood that cleanses us and sanctifies us. Although Aaron could not heal himself, in order for the transplant to work, he needed to be willing to do what the doctors asked, even very difficult, challenging things. Although we can't save ourselves, when we submit to the Lord's will and keep our covenants, the way is open for our redemption. Like the remarkable process of the very DNA of Aaron's blood cells changing, we can have our hearts changed, have His image in our countenances, and become new creatures in Christ. Alma reminded the people of Zarahemla of the previous generation that had been converted. Speaking of his father, Alma explained that According to his faith, there was a mighty change wrought in his heart. He then asked, Have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts? It wasn't the people who changed their own hearts. The Lord performed the actual change. Alma was very clear about this. He said, Behold, He changed their hearts. They humbled themselves and put their trust in the true and living God and were faithful until the end and were saved. The people were willing to open their hearts and exercise faith, and then the Lord changed their hearts. And what a mighty change it was! Think of the difference in the lives of these two men named Alma before and after their hearts were changed. We are children of God with a majestic destiny. 
we can be changed to become like Him and have a fullness of joy. Satan, on the other hand, would have us be miserable like he is. We have the ability to choose whom we follow. When we follow Satan, we give him power. When we follow God, he gives us power. The Savior taught that we should be perfect. This can seem so daunting. I can clearly see my personal inadequacies and am painfully aware of the distance between me and perfection. We may have a tendency to think we have to perfect ourselves, but that is not possible. Following every suggestion and every self-help book in the world will not bring it about. There is only one way and one name whereby perfection comes. We are made perfect through Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, who wrought out this perfect atonement through the shedding of his own blood. Our perfection is only possible through God's grace. Can you imagine how overwhelming it would have been for our young grandson Aaron to assume he had to understand and perform all the medical procedures associated with his transplant? We should not assume we need to do what only the Savior can do in the miraculous process of our perfection. As Moroni concluded his record, he taught, Yea, come unto Christ, and be perfected in Him. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is His grace sufficient for you, that by His grace ye may be perfect in Christ. What a comforting and powerful truth! His grace is sufficient for me. His grace is sufficient for you. His grace is sufficient for all who labor and are heavy laden. With medical treatments like Aaron's, there is always some uncertainty of the outcome. In fact, Aaron needed a second transplant when the first one had complications. Thankfully, with a spiritual change of heart, we don't have to wonder if it will happen. When we live according to His will, relying wholly upon the merits of Him who is mighty to save, there is a 100 percent guarantee of being cleansed by the Savior's blood and eventually being perfected in Him. He is a God of truth and cannot lie. There is no question that this process of change takes time and will not be completed until after this life. But the promise is sure. When the fulfillment of God's promises seem far off, we still embrace those promises, knowing they will be fulfilled. The miraculous change in Aaron's health has brought great joy to our family. Imagine the great joy in heaven as mighty changes happen in our souls. Our Heavenly Father and our Savior Jesus Christ love us and have graciously offered to change us and perfect us. They want to do this. It is central to their work and glory. I testify they have power to do this as we come to them in faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As directed, the congregation will join the choir in singing Glory to God on High. After the singing, we will be pleased to hear from Elder Ulysses Sawaris of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elders James W. McConkie III and Jorge F. Ceballos of the Seventy. Following their remarks, the choir will sing, I'll go where you want me to go.
This is the Saturday afternoon session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Within the first few months of our marriage, <clears throat> my dear wife expressed her desire to study music. Intending to please her, I decided to orchestrate a big, heartfelt surprise to my sweetheart. I went to a musical instrument store and bought her a piano as a gift. I excitedly put the purchase receipt in a box with a beautiful ball and gave it to her expecting an effusive reaction of gratitude for her extremely loving and attentive husband. <laughs> when she opened that little box and saw its contents, she lovingly looked at me and said, Oh, my dear, you are wonderful. But let me ask you a question. Is this a gift or a debt? After counseling together about the surprise, we decided to cancel the purchase. We were living on a student budget, as is the case with many young newlyweds. This experience helped me recognize the importance of the principle of full partnership in a marital relationship and how its application could help my wife and me to be of one heart and one mind. The restored gospel of Jesus Christ proclaims the principle of full partnership between woman and man, both in mortal life and in the eternities. Although each possesses specific attributes and divinely appointed responsibilities, woman and man feel equally relevant and essential roles in God's plan of happiness for His children. This was evident from the very beginning when the Lord declared, that it was not good that man should be alone, wherefore he would make an, an help meet for him. In the Lord's plan, a help meet was a companion who would walk shoulder to shoulder with Adam in full partnership. In fact, Eve was a heavenly blessing in Adam's life. Through her divine nature and spiritual attributes, she inspired Adam to work in partnership with her to achieve God's plan of happiness for all mankind. Let's consider two fundamental principles that strengthen the partnership between man and woman. The first principle is we are all alike unto God. According to gospel doctrine, the difference between woman and man does not override the eternal promises that God has for His sons and daughters. One has no greater possibilities for celestial glory than the other in the eternities. 
the Savior himself invites all of us, God's children, to come to him, to partake of his goodness, and he denieth none that come unto him. Therefore, in this context, we are considered equal before him. When spouses understand and incorporate this principle, they do not position themselves as president or vice president of their family. There is no superiority nor inferiority in the marriage relationship, and neither walks ahead for off or behind the other. They walk side by side as equals the divine offspring of God. They become one in thought, desire, and purpose with our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, leading and guiding the family unit together. In an equal partnership, love is not a possession, but participation, part of the co-creation which is our human calling. With through participation, husband and wife merge into the synergistic oneness of an everlasting dominion that without compulsory means will flow with spiritual life to them and their posterity forever and ever. The second relevant principle is the golden rule taught by the Savior in the Sermon of the Mount. And as ye would that man should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. This principle indicates an attitude of mutuality, reciprocity, unity, and interdependence, and it is based on the second great commandment, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It merges with other Christian attributes such as long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, and kindness. To better understand the application of this principle, we can look at the sacred and eternal bond established by God between our first parents, Adam and Eve. They become one flesh, creating a dimension of unity that allowed them to walk together with respect, gratitude, and love forgetting about themselves and seeking each other's well-being on their journey to eternity. Those same characteristics are what we strive for in a united marriage today. Through the temple ceiling, a woman and man entered the holy order of matrimony in the new and everlasting covenant. By way of this order of the priesthood, they are giving eternal blessings and divine power to direct their family affairs as they live according to the covenants they have made. From that point on, they move forward interdependently and in full partnership with the Lord, especially in regard to each of their divinely appointed responsibilities of nurturing and presiding in their family. Nurturing and presiding are interrelated and overlapping responsibilities which means that mothers and fathers are obligated to help one another as equal partners and share a balanced leadership in their home. To nurture means to nourish, teach, and support family members, which is done by helping them to learn gospel truths and develop faith in Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ in an environment of love. To preside means to help lead family members back to dwell with, in God's presence. This is done by serving and teaching with gentleness, meekness, and pure love. It also includes leading family members in regular prayer, gospel study, and other aspects of worship. Parents work in unity, following the example of Jesus Christ, to fulfill these two great responsibilities. It is important to observe that the government in the family follows the patriarchal pattern, differing in some respects from the priesthood leadership in the Church. The patriarchal pattern entails that wives and husbands are accountable directly to God for the fulfillment of their sacred responsibilities in the family. It calls for a full partnership, a willing compliance with every principle of righteousness and accountability, and provides opportunities for development within an environment of love and mutual helpfulness. These special responsibilities do not imply hierarchy and absolutely exclude any kind of abuse 
or improper use of authority. The experience of Adam and Eve after they left the Garden and Eve beautifully illustrates the concept of interdependence between a mother and father in nurturing and presiding over their family. As taught in the Book of Moses, they work it together to till the earth by the sweat of their brow in order to provide for the physical well-being of their family. They brought children into the world. They called on the name of the Lord together and heard His voice from the way toward the Garden of Eden. They accepted the commandments the Lord gave them and strove together to obey them. They then made these things know unto their sons and their daughters and ceased not to call upon God to, get, to God together according to their needs. My dear brothers and sisters, nurturing and presiding are opportunities, not ex exclusive limitations. One person may have a responsibility for something, but may not be the only person doing it. When loving parents well understand these two major responsibilities, they will strive together to protect and care for the physical and emotional well-being of their children. They also help them face the spiritual dangers of our day by nurturing them with the good word of the Lord as revealed to His prophets. Although husband and wife support each other in their divinely appointed responsibilities, disability, death, or other circumstances may necessitate individual adaptation. Sometimes one spouse or the other will have the responsibility of acting in both roles simultaneously, whether temporarily or permanently. I recently met a sister and a brother who each live in this condition. As single parents, each of them within their family sphere and in partnership with the Lord, have decided to devote their lives to the spiritual and temporal care of their children. They have not lost sight of their temple covenants made with the Lord and His eternal promises despite their divorces. Both have sought the Lord's help in all things as they continually strive to endure their challenges and walk in the covenant path. They trust that the Lord will take care of their needs, not only in this life, but throughout eternity. Both have nurtured their children by teaching them with gentleness, meekness, and pure love, even while experiencing difficult circumstances in life. From what I know, these two single parents do not blame God for their misfortunes. Instead, they look forward with a perfect brightness of hope and confidence to the blessings the Lord has in store for them. Brothers and sisters, the Savior set the perfect example of unity and harmony of purpose and doctrine with our Father in heaven. He prayed in behalf of His disciples, saying that they all may be one as Thou, Father, art in me, and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us that they may be one, even as we are one. I testify to you that as we, women and men, work together in a true and equal partnership, we will enjoy the unity taught by the Savior as we fulfill the divine responsibilities in our marriage relationships. I promise you, in the name of Christ, that hearts, hearts will be knit together in unity and love, one towards another. We will find more joy in our journey to eternal life and our capacity to serve one another and with one another will multiply significantly. I bear witness to these truths in the name of the Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers, sisters, friends, in 2013, my wife Laurel and I were called to serve as mission leaders in the Czech-Slovak mission. Our four children served with us. 
We were blessed as a family with brilliant missionaries and by the remarkable Czech and Slovak saints. We loved them. As our family entered the mission field, something Elder Joseph B. Worthlin taught went with us. In a talk titled, The Great Commandment, Elder Worthlin asked, Do you love the Lord? His counsel to those of us who would answer yes was simple and profound. Spend time with Him. Meditate on His words. Take His yoke upon you. Seek to understand and obey. Elder Worthlin then promised transformative blessings to those willing to give time and place to Jesus Christ. We took Elder Worthlin's counsel and promise to heart. Together with our missionaries, we spent extended time with Jesus, studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John from the New Testament and 3rd Nephi from the Book of Mormon. At the end of every missionary meeting, we found ourselves back in what we referred to as the five Gospels, reading, discussing, considering, and learning about Jesus. For me, for Laurel, and for our missionaries, Spending time with Jesus in the scriptures changed everything. We gained a deeper appreciation for who he was and what was important to him. Together, we considered how he taught, what he taught, the ways he showed love, what he did to bless and serve, his miracles, how he responded to betrayal, what he did with difficult human emotions, his titles and names, how he listened, how he resolved conflict, the world he lived in, his parables, how he encouraged unity and kindness, his capacity to forgive and to heal, his sermons, his prayers, his atoning sacrifice, his resurrection, his gospel. We often felt like the short of stature Zacchaeus, running to climb a sycamore tree as Jesus passed through Jericho because, as Luke described it, we sought to see Jesus who he was was not Jesus as we wanted or wished him to be, but rather Jesus as he really was and is. Just as Elder Worthlin had promised, we learned in a very real way that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of transformation. It takes us as men and women of the earth and refines us into men and women for the eternities. Those were special days. We came to believe that with God, nothing shall be impossible. Sacred afternoons in Prague, Bratislava, or Brno, experiencing the power and reality of Jesus continue to resonate in all of our lives. We often studied Mark 2, verses 1 to 12. The story there is compelling. I want to read part of it directly from Mark and then share it as I have come to understand it after comprehensive study and discussion with our missionaries and others. And again, Jesus entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Then after an exchange with some in the crowd, Jesus looks at the man sick of palsy and heals him physically, saying, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Now the story is I have come to understand it. Early in his ministry, Jesus returned to Capernaum, a small fishing village located on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. He had recently performed a series of miracles by healing the sick and casting out evil spirits. Anxious to hear and experience the man called Jesus, the villagers gathered at the home where he was rumored to be staying. As they did, Jesus began to teach. Homes at that time in Capernaum were flat-roofed, single-story dwellings grouped together. The roof and walls were a mixture of stone, timber, clay, and thatch, accessed by a set of simple steps on the side of the home. 
The crowd grew quickly at the house, filled the room where Jesus was teaching, and spread out into the street. The story focuses on a man sick of the palsy and his four friends. Palsy is a form of paralysis, often accompanied by weakness and tremors. I imagine one of the four saying to the others, Jesus is in our village. We all know about the miracles he has performed and those he has healed. If we can just get our friend to Jesus, perhaps he too can be made whole. So they each take a corner of their friend's mat or bed and begin carrying him through the crooked, narrow, unpaved streets of Capernaum. Muscles aching, they turn the last corner only to find that the crowd, or as the scripture calls it, the press of people gathered to listen, is so great that getting to Jesus is impossible. With love and faith, the four do not give up. Rather, they scramble up the steps onto the flat roof, carefully lift their friend and his bed up with them, break open the roof over the room where Jesus is teaching, and let their friend down. Consider, brothers and sisters, that in the middle of what must have been a serious teaching moment, Jesus hears a scratching noise, looks up, and sees a growing hole in the ceiling as dust and thatch fall into the room. A paralyzed man on a bed is then lowered to the floor. Remarkably, Jesus discerns that this is not an interruption, but rather something that matters. He looks at the man on the bed, publicly forgives his sins, and physically heals him. With that telling of Mark 2 in mind, several important truths become clear about Jesus as the Christ. First, when we try to help someone we love come unto Christ, we can do so with confidence that he has the capacity to lift the burden of sin and to forgive. Second, When we bring physical, emotional, or other illnesses to Christ, we can do so knowing he has the power to heal and comfort. Third, when we make effort like the four to bring others to Christ, we can do so with certainty that he sees our true intentions and will appropriately honor them. Remember, Jesus' teaching was disrupted by the appearance of a hole in the roof. Rather than chastise or dismiss the four who made the hole for interrupting, The scripture tells us that Jesus saw their faith. Those that witnessed the miracle then marveled and glorified God, which had given such power to men. Brothers and sisters, let me close with two additional observations. Whether as missionaries, ministers, Relief Society presidents, bishops, teachers, parents, siblings, or friends, we are all engaged as Latter-day Saint disciples in the work of bringing others to Christ. Thus, the qualities exhibited by the four friends are worth considering and emulating. They are bold, adaptive, resilient, creative, versatile, hopeful, determined, faithful, optimistic, humble, and enduring. Additionally, the four emphasize the spiritual importance of community and fellowship. In order to bring their friend to Christ, each of the four must carry their corner. If one lets go, things get more difficult. If two give up, the task effectively becomes impossible. Each of us has a role to play in the kingdom of God. As we fill that role and do our part, we carry our corner, whether in Argentina or Vietnam, Accra or Brisbane, a branch or a ward, a family or a missionary companionship, we each have a corner to carry. As we do and if we will, the Lord blesses us all. As he saw their faith, so will he see ours and bless us as a people. At different times, I have carried the corner of a bed, and at other times, I have been the one carried. Part of the power of this remarkable story of Jesus is that it reminds us just how much we need each other as brothers and sisters, to come unto Christ and be transformed. These are a few of the things I have learned from spending time with Jesus in Mark 2. May God grant that we may be able to carry our corner, that we may not shirk, that we may not fear, but that we may be strong in our faith and determined in our work to accomplish the purposes of the Lord. I witness that Jesus lives, that he knows us, and that he has the power to heal, to transform, and to forgive. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Over the years, from this beautiful pulpit at the Conference Center, we have received magnificent counsel, inspiration, instruction, and revelation. On occasion, speakers have used comparisons associated with their areas of knowledge and experience to illustrate clearly and powerfully a principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this way, for example, we have learned about airplanes and flights in which a tiny initial deviation can lead us to a place far from our original destination. Also in this way, we have learned from a comparison of the function of our physical heart with the powerful change of heart required to respond to the Lord's invitation to follow Him. This time, I would like to humbly add a comparison inspired from an area in the field of my professional preparation. I'm referring to the world of civil engineering. From the beginning of my university studies, I dream of the day when I would complete the requirements to be qualified to take the class that would teach me how to design buildings and other structures that could be then be considered anti-seismic. The day finally arrived for my first class on this subject. The first words from the professor were the following. You are surely anxious to begin this course and learn how to design anti-seismic structures, to which many of us eagerly nodded our heads. Then the professor said, I'm sorry to tell you that this is not possible, for I cannot teach you how to design a building that is against, that is anti, or that is opposed to an earthquake. This makes no sense, he said, because earthquakes will occur anyway, whether we like it or not. Then he added, what I can teach you is how to design structures that are seismic resistant, a structure that can resist the forces coming from an earthquake so that the structure remains standing without suffering any serious damage and can then continue offering the service for which it had been conceived. The engineer makes the calculations that indicate the dimensions, the qualities and characteristics of the foundations, columns, beams, concrete slabs, and other structural elements being designed. These results are translated into plans and technical specifications which must be strictly followed by the builder in order for the work to materialize and thus fulfill the purpose for which it was designed and is being built. Although more than 40 years have passed since that first class in seismic resistant engineering, I perfectly remember the moment when I began to acquire a deeper, more complete understanding of the vital importance that this concept would be present in the structures that I would design in my future professional life. But not only that, but even more important, that it would be permanently present in the edification of my own life and in those over whom I might exercise a positive influence. How blessed we are to count on a knowledge of the plan of salvation created by our Heavenly Father, to have the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, and to rely on the inspired direction of living prophets All the former constitute the divinely plans and the technical specifications that teach us clearly how to construct happy lives, lives that are resistant to sin, resistant to temptation, resistant to attacks from Satan, who is desperately seeking to frustrate our eternal destiny to be together with our Heavenly Father and with our beloved families. The Savior himself, at the beginning of his ministry, was left to be tempted of the devil. But Jesus emerged successful from that great trial. How would having had an attitude of anti-Satan or anti-temptation have served him? What made Jesus emerge triumphant from these most difficult moments was his spiritual preparation, which permitted him to be in a condition to resist the temptations of the adversary. What were some of the factors that helped the Savior to be prepared for that crucial moment? First, he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, a fast that must have been accompanied by constant prayer. 
So, although physically weak, his spirit was very strong. Even though, fortunately, we are not asked to fast for such a duration, rather for only 24 hours and once a month, fasting brings us a spiritual strength and prepares us to be resistant to the trials of this life. In the second place, in the account of the temptations to which the Savior was submitted, we see that he always answered Satan having scriptures in his mind, quoting them and applying them at the right moment. When Satan tempted him to convert the stones into bread so that he could satisfy his hunger from his long fast, the Lord said to him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then, when the Lord was on the pinnacle of the temple, the devil tried to tempt him to demonstrate his power, to which the Lord answered with authority. It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And to Satan's third attempt, the Lord responded, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The event of an earthquake leaves its mark even on structures that were correctly designed and built. Such consequences as perhaps some cracks, fallen furniture or ceilings, broken windows, etc. But this well-designed and well-built edifice will fulfill its purpose of protecting its occupants, and with some repairs, it will recuperate its original condition. In similar fashion, the buffetings of the adversary can also cause cracks or some partial damage in our lives, in spite of our efforts to build our lives according to the perfect divine design. These cracks can manifest, manifest themselves through feelings of sadness or remorse for having committed some errors and for not having done everything perfectly, or for feeling that we are not as good as we want to be. But what is truly relevant is that for having followed the divine design plans and specifications, that is, the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are still standing. The structure of our lives has not been demolished because of the adversary's efforts or for difficult situations that we, that we have had to face. Rather, we are ready to move forward. The joy promised in the scriptures as the purpose of our existence should not be understood to mean that we will have no difficulties or sorrows, that we have no cracks as consequences of the temptations, of adversity, or from the actual trials of our earth life. This joy has to do with Nephi's perspective on life when he said, Having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days, all his days, even the days that Nephi suffered during the incomprehension and rejections of his own brothers, even when they tied him up on the ship, even the day that his father Lehi passed away, even when Laman and Lemuel became mortal enemies of his people, even in those difficult days, Nephi felt highly favored of the Lord. We can have the tranquility of knowing that the Lord will never permit us to be tempted beyond what we can resist. Alma invites us to watch and pray continually, that we may not be tempted above that which we can bear, and thus be led by the Holy Spirit, becoming humble, meek, submissive, patient, full of love, and all long-suffering. The same can be applied to the trials of life. Ammon reminds us of the words of the Lord, Go and bear with patience thine afflictions, and I will give unto you success. The Lord always provides us with an escape when we face adversity, temptation, incomprehension, infirmities, and even death. He has said, And now verily I say unto you, and what I say unto one, I say unto all, be of good cheer, little children, for I am in your midst, and I have not forsaken you. He will never abandon us. I pray that we may continue to build our lives following the plans and technical specifications of the divine design authored by our Father and achieved through our Savior Jesus Christ. 
Thus, because of the grace that reaches us through the atonement of our Savior, we will be successful in constructing a life resistant to sin, resistant to temptation, and strengthened to endure the sad, difficult times in our lives. And furthermore, we will be in condition to access all the blessings promised through the love of our Father and our Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are grateful for all who have spoken to us this afternoon and for the beautiful music that has been provided. We remind you of the Saturday evening general session, which will be broadcast from this conference center this evening at 6 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. The nationwide broadcast of Music and the Spoken Word will air tomorrow morning from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. 
The Sunday morning session of conference will immediately follow. Our concluding speaker for this session will be Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing Hope of Israel. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Hans T. Boom of the Seventy. I would like to speak about what I call the doctrine of belonging in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This doctrine has three parts. The role of belonging in gathering the Lord's covenant people, the importance of service and sacrifice in belonging, and the centrality of Jesus Christ to belonging. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in its early beginnings was made up largely of white North American and Northern European Saints, with a relative handful of Native Americans, African Americans, and Pacific Islanders. Now, eight years away from the 200th anniversary of its founding, the Church has greatly increased in numbers and diversity in North America and even more so in the rest of the world. As the long-prophesied Latter-day Gathering of the Lord's Covenant people gains momentum, the Church will truly be comprised of members from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This is not a calculated or forced diversity, but a naturally occurring phenomenon that we would expect, recognizing that the gospel net gathers from every nation and every people. How blessed we are to see the day that Zion is being established simultaneously on every continent and in our own neighborhoods. As the Prophet Joseph Smith said, the people of God in every age have looked forward with joyful anticipation to this day, and we are the favored people that God has made choice of to bring about the Latter-day glory. Having been given this privilege, we cannot permit any racism, tribal prejudice, or other divisions to exist in the Latter-day Church of Christ. The Lord commands us, be one, and if you're not one, you're not mine. We should be diligent in rooting prejudice and discrimination out of the Church, out of our homes, and most of all, out of our hearts. As our Church population grows ever more diverse, our welcome must grow ever more spontaneous and warm. We need one another. In his first epistle to the Corinthians, Paul declares that all who are baptized into the Church are one in the body of Christ. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. A sense of belonging is important to our physical, mental, and spiritual well-being, yet it is quite possible that at times each of us might feel that we don't fit in. In discouraging moments, we may feel that we will never measure up to the Lord's high standards or the expectations of others. We may unwittingly impose expectations on others or even ourselves that are not the Lord's expectations. We may communicate in subtle ways that the worth of a soul is based on certain achievements or callings, but these are not the measure of our standing in the Lord's eyes. The Lord looketh on the heart. He cares about our desires and longings and what we are becoming. Sister Jody King wrote of her own experience of past years, quote, 
I never felt like I didn't belong at church until my husband, Cameron, and I began struggling with infertility. The children and families who had typically brought me joy to see at church now started causing me grief and pain. I felt barren without a child in my arms or a diaper bag in hand. The hardest Sunday was our first one in a new ward. Because we didn't have kids, we were asked if we were newlyweds and when we planned on starting a family. I would gotten pretty good at answering these questions without letting them affect me. I knew they weren't meant to be hurtful. However, on this Sunday, answering those questions was especially hard. We had just found out, after being hopeful, that we were, yet again, not pregnant. I walked into sacrament meeting feeling downtrodden, and answering those typical get-to-know-you questions was hard for me. But it was Sunday school that truly broke my heart. The lesson, intended to be about the divine role of mothers, quickly shifted gears and became a venting session. My heart sank and tears silently flowed down my cheeks as I heard women complain about a blessing I would give anything for. I bolted out of church, and at first I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to experience that feeling of isolation again. But that night, after talking with my husband, we knew we would keep attending church, not only because the Lord has asked us to, but also because we both knew that the joy that comes from renewing covenants and feeling the Spirit at church surpasses the sadness I felt that day. In the church, there are widowed, divorced, and single members, those with family members who have fallen away from the gospel, people with chronic illnesses or financial struggles, members who experience same-sex attraction, members working to overcome addictions or doubts, recent converts, new move-ins, empty nesters, and the list goes on and on. The Savior invites us to come unto Him, no matter our circumstances. We come to Church to renew our covenants, to increase our faith, to find peace, and to do as He did perfectly in His life, minister to others who feel like they don't belong." End quote. Paul explained that the Church and its officers are given by God for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It is a sad irony, then, when someone feeling he or she doesn't meet the ideal in all aspects of life concludes they don't belong in the very organization designed by God to help us progress toward the ideal. Let us leave judgment in the Lord's hands and those He has commissioned and be content to love and treat each other the best we can. Let us ask Him to show us the way, day by day, to bring in the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind, that is, everyone, to the great feast of the Lord. A second facet of the doctrine of belonging has to do with our own contributions. Although we rarely think about it, much of our belonging comes from our service and the sacrifices we make for others and for the Lord. Excessive focus on our personal needs, our own comfort, can frustrate that sense of belonging. We strive to follow the Savior's doctrine. Whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. Belonging comes not as we wait for it, but as we reach out to help one another. Today, unfortunately, consecrating oneself to a cause or sacrificing anything for anyone else is becoming countercultural. In a piece for Deseret Magazine last year, author Rod Dreher recounted a conversation with a young mother in Budapest, quoting, I'm on a Budapest tram with a friend in her early 30s. Let's call her Christina. While we're on the way to interview an older Christian woman who, with her late husband, 
withstood persecution by the communist state. As we bump along the city's streets, Christina talks about how hard it is to be honest with her friends, friends her age, about the struggles she faces as a wife and mother of young children. Christina's difficulties are completely ordinary for a young woman learning how to be a mom and a wife, yet the prevailing attitude among her generation is that life's difficulties are a threat to one's well-being and should be refused. Do she and her husband argue at times? Then she should leave him, they say. Are her children annoying her? Then she should send them to daycare. Christina worries that her friends don't grasp that trials and even suffering are a normal part of life, and maybe even part of a good life, if that suffering teaches us how to be patient, kind, and loving. University of Notre Dame sociologist of religion Christian Smith found in his study of adults ages 18 to 23 that most of them believe society is nothing more than, quote, a collection of autonomous individuals out to enjoy life, unquote. By this philosophy, anything that one finds difficult is a form of oppression. By contrast, our pioneer forebears derived a deep sense of belonging, unity, and hope in Christ by the sacrifices they made to serve missions, build temples, abandon comfortable homes under duress, and begin again, and in a multitude of other ways consecrate themselves and their means to the cause of Zion. They were willing to sacrifice even their lives if necessary, and we are all the beneficiaries of their endurance. The same is true for many today who may lose family and friends, forfeit employment opportunities, or otherwise suffer discrimination or intolerance as a consequence of being baptized. Their reward, however, is a powerful sense of belonging among the covenant people. Any sacrifice we make in the Lord's cause helps to confirm our place with Him who gave His life a ransom for many. The final and most important element of the doctrine of belonging is the central role of Jesus Christ. We don't join the Church for fellowship alone, important as that is. We join for redemption through the love and grace of Jesus Christ. We join to secure the ordinances of salvation and exaltation for ourselves and those we love on both sides of the veil. We join to participate in a great project to establish Zion in preparation for the Lord's return. The Church is the custodian of the covenants of salvation and exaltation that God offers us through the ordinances of the Holy Priesthood. It is by keeping these covenants that we obtain the highest and deepest sense of belonging. President Russell M. Nelson recently wrote, Once you and I have made a covenant with God, our relationship with Him becomes much closer than before our covenant. Now we are bound together. Because of our covenant with God, He will never tire in His efforts to help us, and we will never exhaust His merciful patience with us. Each of us has a special place in God's heart. Jesus Christ is the guarantor of those covenants." Unquote. If we will remember this, the Lord's high hopes for us will inspire, not discourage us. We can feel joy as we pursue individually and communally the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Despite disappointments and setbacks along the way, it's a grand quest. We lift and encourage each other in pursuing the upward path, knowing that no matter tribulation, no matter delays and promised blessings, we can be of good cheer, for Christ has overcome the world and we are with Him. Being one with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is without doubt the ultimate in belonging. Thus the doctrine of belonging comes down to this. Each one of us can affirm. Jesus Christ died for me. He thought me worthy of His blood. He loves me and can make all the difference in my life. As I repent, His grace will transform me. I am one with Him in the gospel covenant. I belong in His Church and Kingdom, 
and I belong in His cause to bring redemption to all of God's children. I testify you do belong. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Dearly beloved Heavenly Father, at the conclusion of this wonderful, beautiful session of conference, we, we come to Thee to thank Thee. Thank Thee for the blessing of having been able to listen to Thy servants, having been edified and strengthened by the beautiful music, the messages and the music all testifying of our beloved Savior Jesus Christ, whom we love so much. And Father, we ask Thee to help all of us and each and every one of us to understand who we are, being the hope of Israel, to all understand how to carry our corner. We ask Thee a blessing over our beloved Prophet President Russell M. Nelson, the members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelfth. Bless them with health and strength. 
Help us, Father, when we prepare our minds and our hearts for this evening and for the remainder of this weekend, that we may understand our part. And we ask Thee to help us on our journey. We pray these things humbly in the name, in the name of Thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the Saturday afternoon session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session was provided by a missionary choir. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>